shopping. They're touchy-feely people. They're very busy. If they're not at work or at school, they're stuck in traffic. That's Brazilians for me. They're just so incredible, but human in the end. They just have such a hard time trusting anything that comes after something you say about Jesus. They already have this idea, this false idea of who he is, and there's nothing about Jesus that is life-giving to them. Então, você não deve fazer isso e aquilo, e se você faz isso, Deus, Deus não vai te amar. E isso me afastou muito de frequentar as igrejas e, e de Deus. That's hard. It's hard to continue day after day when, um, sorry, Lord, why, why am I here when these people that like you've let me love, like you are not what they want. And there have been plenty of days until today that I just want to give up, but I just keep reminding myself that the power of salvation is not in my hands and it's all in Jesus. And he is so capable and so able of changing their hearts because he has changed mine. E aí teve um dia que eu tava me sentindo um pouco triste e eu lembrei da Amanda. E eu decidi mandar uma mensagem para ela. She ended up sending me a text one day and said, I'm upset. I'm not necessarily enjoying the way that my life's going and I want to change. And in that moment, I just put it all out there and said, I'm doing about 500 things with my church today. If you'd like to come along, you're welcome to any of it. And she was like, absolutely. I was so surprised, but she said, absolutely, let's go. With Amanda, the Brazilian Amanda, she actually asked me to study the word with her. And just last week when we were reading, she was like brought to tears that God would love her even though she, she has come to the realization that she is a sinner, that she is separated from God. But the truth that He loves her when all she has known is that she's a sinner, God judges her. She was like, there's no other God who says this. I don't feel total confidence in this, but... Eu estou buscando e... What love that he has demonstrated to her. Like this city is huge, this world is huge, and he cares about the separation of one of his creation. That's crazy. <laughs> I don't know. I'd find out video early, but that's crazy. I'm sorry. So the greatest thing ever happened last night. Yeah. <laughs> Our friend Amanda chose to put her faith in Jesus. I know that it's so real, and I know that the Holy Spirit is moving in her, and it's just amazing to see Amanda in the purest form and just understanding what she has won in Christ and the victory that He has won for her. But now comes like the most exciting part of her knowing relationship with God. And God is gonna use her to bring others to know Him and to, I mean, she has a redemption story. She has a from death to life story. This is a reality that God is saving people and He is pursuing young adults in Sao Paulo and He is not giving up. Redemption stories say amen. amen. Thank the Lord for his salvation. Thank him for Jesus.
uh, Christ for his death, for his resurrection. Welcome to chapel today. It is the last chapel of this semester, and so whether you're joining us in person or via live uh, stream, we're thankful today uh, that we are here to gather in the presence of the Lord. We're also thankful to have Onita Baptist Institute with us, one of the sister agencies and institutions of the Kentucky Baptist Convention, and their choir is going to bless us in song in just a few moments, as well as their president, Dr. Larry Gritton, who will be blessing us with a message today as well. And so we're thankful that you are here. Pray that you'll make yourself at home and just enjoy the spirit of the Lord. Uh, we do want to remind you that uh, we are in that season of collecting the Lottie Moon Christmas offering to support international missionaries doing the work of the Lord around the world. And so you have that opportunity to give in this final chap uh, chapel of this semester. And so we'll have folks at the doors on the way out collecting those envelopes and any gift that uh, God has provided through you today. I'm going to ask Cayman Noble to come. Cayman's going to lead us in prayer. And after he uh, prays today, then uh, the choir will be free to lead us in worship. Well, good morning. There were no prayer requests in the prayer box today, but I'm sure everybody has a few prayer requests on their heart, especially being that we have finals next week, and if you're uh, anything like the classes that I've had this week, we've already taken some finals, uh, so that's got to be a bit hard on us, and not only that, but it's holiday season, uh, so with that, I ask that you uh, pray for the... Um, there's three families in specific, the Johnson family, Mesmer family, and Andrews family. On Thanksgiving night, uh, two, three of my brother and sister's friends were murdered, um, and they have captured one of the people who have done it, but one of them is still fleeing, uh, so it's hard, uh, not only on my family, but obviously on their family as well, especially given that it's the holiday season. So let's remember them and remember each other as we are heading into finals week, and after that, we've got about a month uh, to do uh, focus on ministry and uh, uh, the upcoming semester as well. So let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for gathering us here, Lord. Lord, thank you for Onita and the president being here today, Lord. Lord, I ask that you guide them and help them uh, as they uh, do what you've called them to do, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you be with us. Lord, open up our hearts and our mind. Uh, to your word today, Lord. Lord, I pray that you be with us during uh, this upcoming finals week and afterwards uh, in, the, in the things that you've called us to in our time with our family, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you be with these families uh, who are grieving uh, over these losses, Lord. And Lord, I pray that uh, you continue to be with Taylor and Tabitha as they're still uh, grieving and mourning over the loss of uh, Tabitha's mom, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for who you are and uh, what you are doing, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the Spirit, one church empowered by Him. Communion of God's people, forgiveness of our sins, our bodies resurrected to everlasting life, to worship love and wonder before the throne. Oh, 
can see this morning. Before I get cranked up, I'm going to have these guys come to the mic and tell you their name, where they're from, and how long they've been at OBI before they go have take a seat. All right? Caitlin, you want to go first? Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm from Ashland, Kentucky, and this is my first year at OBI. Hi, my name is Chloe. I'm from China. This is my first year in OBI. I'm Ivy. I'm originally from upstate New York, but I live in northern Kentucky now. Um, this is my fourth year at OBI. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm from Thailand, and this is my first year in OBI. Uh, I'm Mercy. I'm from Ethiopia, and this is my first year in OBI. I'm afraid I'm from Liberia. This is my first year in OBI. I'm Liv. I'm from Bowling Green, Kentucky, and this is my first year at OBI. I'm Ola. I'm from Nigeria. This is my second year in OBI and choir. <laughs> I'm Nicole. I'm from Virginia, and this is my fifth year at OBI. I'm Hope. I'm from Georgetown, Kentucky, and this is my first year at OBI. I'm Cambria. I'm from Puerto Rico. Um, this is my second year OBI, first year in choir. Hi, my name is Jordan. I'm from Owensboro, Kentucky, and this is my second year at OBI. I'm Jasmine. I'm from North Carolina, and this is my fifth year at OBI. Hi, my name is John. I'm from Thailand. It is my first year for me in OBI. Hi, my name is Wen. I'm from Bangkok, Thailand. This is my fourth year at OBI and third year in choir. I'm Seth Smith. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is my fifth year at OBI and fourth year in choir. I'm just plain old Larry, and this is my 31st year at OBI. Actually, if you add up all my time as a a youngster when my parents were on staff and then as a student and a staff member formerly and now my time in this role it adds up to 31 years so better part of my life. Uh, they get nervous when I have them do that. They don't like doing that. Uh, but that's a small price to pay to get out of school all day, go. go somewhere and get a good lunch. And uh, so this, this choir goes all over our state. A lot of times it's some long bus rides, early Sunday mornings, even late nights every now and then uh, coming home. They do a great job kind of serving as the face of our institution and helping tell our story and going into churches all across our state who love us and support us and uh, help us to do what we do. Much like you folks, I know are very similar in terms of your support system and Kentucky Baptists and folks that are such a big part of that. And there's so many connections in this room, not just the Clear Creek OBI, but East Barberville and just Macedonia where Charlie used to be and just folks and churches who love us and support us and uh, help us what do what we do. We're appreciative of that. Uh, it's Mr. Tim Cochran's our choir director. He's in his 54th year of service on our staff. I know he doesn't look that old. It's actually his 24th year and uh, he'd been with us a good long while. And while he was directing, leading, singing, doing all different things, uh, Josh leaned over and said, that's a talented guy. I said, yeah, and he drove the bus on the way over here today too. <laughs> so <laughs> Tim wears a lot of hats on our campus and uh, I appreciate him very much. Uh, a lot of good OBI connections in the room. Uh, former students, Matt Black back there, and uh, Gabby and Sam Fonseca. Sam slipped out, I thought I saw him earlier. And uh, we're, we're there, he is waving at me from the door. We're, uh, we're proud of them. And uh, that was an OBI baby trying to make his way up on the stage while the kids are singing. I guess he wants to be in the choir one day at OBI. But it's again, just many great uh, connections here. And, and uh, I love Clear Creek. I've never had a direct role at Clear Creek other than just getting to know you, but more than that, uh, more than your institution, your people. It's the people of Clear Creek that I have grown to love. And so it's the people that make us a place special. I have great admiration for your president, Dr. Fox. I'm told he's off playing hooky in Israel. So uh, hopefully that's going well for him. And uh, just, I just always enjoy interacting with you all at KBC events and just different places. And then so many of the churches we go into, it really blows my mind how many of the pastors will say, I'm a Clear Creek guy, and I haven't met a one that I don't, I don't like. I even, um, at functions, at, sometimes at KBC, uh, Donnie will invite people in, uh, alumni of Clear Creek, and have a meal together, and I usually butt in and go with them. So I feel like I'm kind of an honorary 
Clear Creek guy because I have meals with the, the group a lot of times and on Dr. Fox's dime, so that's the, that's the best part. But uh, we appreciate you having us over today and the opportunity just to uh, share with you in worship, and I'm excited to share some things from God's Word uh, with you today. I'm a little smarter than I look. I know lunch usually follows the chapel service, most settings, but uh, I'm excited to share some things with you. If you have God's Word with you, would you turn with me to the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter. John 15, and I want to read verses 5 through 13. Uh, If you would, as you're finding that, if you're able, would you stand with me? And we'll honor the reading of God's Word, beginning in John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love have no man than this than that he lay down his life for his friends. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this uh, special place this time that you've appointed that we could gather into your presence to worship. Father, you are worthy of our praise and our worship, Father, and we bring that to you today. Thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for our many blessings that we often take for granted. Father, as we've come out of the Thanksgiving holiday season, help us to remember to always be grateful for our many blessings. And Father, now as we move toward Christmas and a celebration, of our Savior's birth, Father. Help us to be mindful of the needs of others and their need for that perfect gift through your Son, Jesus. Father, now as we turn to your word, we ask that you'd speak to us. Father, I thank you for this privilege of professing your word. I ask you'd use me as your instrument of peace and hide me behind your cross. Father, we want more of you and less of us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, how many of you like, who, who likes fruit? Anybody like a good piece of fruit? All right, what about candy? Yeah, I remember everybody's going to say, yeah, I, I like candy. We've been tricking people at my office uh, here lately. We are blessed at OBI with an abundance of donated items, a lot of times food items from different places. And uh, we've been getting uh, some Ghirardelli chocolate. That's kind of, you know, it's high-end stuff. It's I wouldn't buy it because it, it's out of my price range, but uh, we... We give that away, and um, we took it to us with us to the convention, the annual meeting, the KBC over in Pikeville. People, oh, this is good stuff. And I said, oh, we don't even touch it because we've had so much of it, we can't hardly stand the, the sight of it. But I was digging through some of our supplies to kind of refill a little uh, basket uh, that sits on the conference table at my office, and I, it wasn't Ghirardelli. I found something else in the package. Man, it looked sharp. It was just kind of just different colored, and uh, this, I thought, this is going to be it's going to be good. It said dark chocolate. It's all the word almond on it, and it's going to be great. So I tore one of those open, and I bit into it, and I can taste that chocolate. I can taste the almond, and then I tasted something, and it was a, apparently it was a date. I guess that's a fruit. I don't know. But I thought, eh, this isn't too good. We can't hardly give those things away at my office. We can't get people to, to take them. But sometimes uh, we have to wrap things in packages to make them look a little different than they are. Kind of like some of us, maybe put on a coat and tie, and we think we can dress that up a little bit and make it look better. It really doesn't make any difference. But uh, that chocolate-covered date, I thought it was going to be all right, and it really, it really wasn't once I bit into it. But this passage of Scripture is really it's about bearing fruit, and the way to bear fruit is to stay connected to the vine. The best advice I could give you, those of you who are uh, educating yourselves, you're getting an education here at Clear Creek, to eventually head into ministry. Perhaps you're already ministering now bivocationally, but the best advice I could give you is to remain in His love, to remain connected to the source of love, remain connected to the vine. passage tells us when we don't do that as the branches, we're going to wither. 
we're going to die. We're not going to be effective. I know that you're starting as you start in ministry. You, you want to be effective. There's no question about that. I'm sure that's what's on your heart and mind is how can I be most effective? You'll find yourself later in, many, in your ministry years trying to figure out, am I being effective? What can I do differently to be more effective? When leaders aren't doing that, they're probably not doing their job. You have to reflect and look and decide and ask God to reveal to you, are you being effective as you should be? So we need to stay connected to the vine. Now, I know we're in Pineville, Kentucky, and you have something in this area called Chain Rock. Is that correct? We were driving in on the bus. I pointed out to one of our young ladies sitting in the seat behind me. I said, you see, you see that up there on that hillside? He said, you see that rock? At first, you couldn't quite see it, and we drove a little further, and you could see that, that chain to that rock. Chained rock. Well, I'm here to tell you that we, our foundation is built on the rock. Our rock needs no chain <laughs> to help hold it into place. We need to stand on that foundation, the rock that is Jesus Christ. And as we do that, we stay connected to the vine. And it gives us what we need. If we don't stay connected to the vine, we will not be effective in ministry. We'll, really be, we'll fall flat on our face. We'll be wasting our time. You want to give and pour into people, you better be filling your own spiritual tank, so to say. And the best way to do that is stay connected to the vine. The past of the preceding verses, verses 1 through 4 in that chapter that I did not read, uh, talks about bearing fruit and that we cannot bear fruit unless we remain in Him. Are you remaining in Him today? Verse 5, where I picked up and where we shared together, says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in Him. If you don't remain in Him, you will fall. You don't have to look very hard or very far to find fallen pastors, to find guys or people that you thought, boy, they were really kind of on a pedestal and looked like they had it all together, and then things changed in an instance. We are all sinners saved by grace. We are all one bad decision away from blowing it and being one of those fallen ministry folks. But the way to ensure against that, to guard against that, is to remain connected to the vine. It says we would remain in him, and then we will bear much through fruit. Verse 6 goes on to say, if we don't remain on him, just the opposite. It'd be thrown away, be withered, thrown away, cast into the fire, and burned. Verse 7 says, if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it'll be given to you. Do we really believe in our heart of hearts the truths of God's Word. Because we read things like that in God's Word, and that particular uh, passage or saying is all over God's Word. Basically saying, you have not because you ask not, or if you ask in my name, you shall receive. Ask anything you will in my name, you will receive. I don't know if we really believe that. How much asking do we do? A child needs something, what do they do? They ask. When they're a baby, what do they do if they have a need? They cry out and let us know that they have a need, even though they can't really speak it to us just yet. We need to cry out to God and let Him know that we need Him. We stay connected to Him. It's very evident that we need Him. But ask whatever you wish. You catch that in verse 7? If you remain in me and my words remain in you. So that's one of those if-then statements in Scripture. If you'll do this, then this will happen for you. If... You'll remain in me, and my words will remain in you. You remain in my word. You can ask, you ask whatever you wish, and it'll be given unto you. You know, I don't think that means you're going to drive a Porsche or a Lamborghini or whatever the car of your choice is. I don't think we're going to need to go ask the Lord, Lord, I sure would like to have that brand new shiny pickup truck or whatever it might be. When we remain in Him, we remain in His word. When His word remains in us, the things we ask for are His things, are the things that He wants for us. We don't go wayward and start asking for things that are not of the Lord. Ask whatever you wish. We won't ask for something that's not of Him when we remain in Him. Verse 8 says, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Fast forward, if you would, in your life and think ahead to the end of your life. You know, unfortunately, it's after someone's dead and gone and people begin to say things, nice things and things that they felt about somebody and 
you know, how, if they loved them. And oftentimes we wait really till it's too late. But fast forward ahead, what, what do you think will be said at your funeral? I tell folks everywhere I go that my parents are my heroes. I'm more and more grateful for my Christian parents, my mom and dad. And uh, my dad's been telling me recently that he wants me one day to do his funeral. And I said, Dad, I don't, know, I don't know if I can do that. I said, could you have done your dad's? And he just kind of had... Doesn't matter. He said, I want you to do it. You know what he said? He said, I don't want somebody up there talking about me that doesn't really know me. <laughs> what will be said about you one day after you're gone, your life? I believe one of the highest compliments we could be paid would be for someone to say he was, she was a disciple. Are you a disciple? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? That's what we're called to do and called to be. And that's to the Father's glory that we can bear much fruit. You know, life is uh, interesting, isn't it? You know, there are twists and turns. As we were coming over here, we followed a pretty windy road. Route 11 and 25E kind of straightens out. But we got every, behind every piece of farm equipment, every slow driver, every construction site. And maybe uh, made Josh a little nervous whether or not we are going to get here. On time, but with, but life and road, the road of life has twists and turns. And it's interesting the things that happen to us. And looking back, if we can reflect and say, you know what, I can see what was going on there. I can see what God was doing. I can now see what God taught me through that. But in the midst of it, sometimes we can't do that. How many of you like to be encouraged? Encouragement's good, right? Everybody likes an attaboy, <laughs> like a pat on the back, a good job, job. Well done. Sometimes, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you, in ministry, if you're not already there yet, sometimes you don't get too many attaboys. You get to hear about a lot of the problems. You get to see a lot of the worst in people. It's funny that, uh, I guess it's not funny, maybe ironic is the right word. When I was a child, my mother used to say to me, you would complain to Jesus. That's something she'd say to me. Now, today, there are times I feel like above my office door, I should put the phrase complaint department, because a lot of times that's what happens. But in leadership, in ministry, you will find yourselves many times dealing with the worst. We all need attaboys. I mentioned earlier that I love your president, Dr. Fox. Give him some attaboys. Sometimes you don't know what's going on <laughs> behind closed door and what he's dealing with. And what's going on? You maybe don't need you don't need to know, and you wouldn't want to know many times. But we need to encourage one another. I I, I love the work of Clear Creek. I tell Dr. Fox all the time, you guys are doing the second best work in this state here at Clear Creek, and you know what I think is the first. But we're together. We're doing God's work, and it's just just it's down to us in our convention as far as educational institutions. It's OBI, and it's Clear Creek. But it's a blessing and honor to be a part of God's work. I don't know anywhere in God's word where it says, if you'll do this, then it will be easy for you. There are a lot of if-thens, but there are going to be trials, there are going to be challenges, there's going to be heartbreak. There will be heartache and heartbreak in ministry. But that doesn't mean you throw in the towel. That doesn't mean you say, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. It doesn't mean you continue to do it, but you've checked out. And you don't put yourself out there anymore because you've, you've been hurt. You've had your heart broken. You've seen the worst. But we're to remain obedient. If you would, if you held your place in John 15, if you didn't, would you jump back over to the 14th chapter for just a second? John 14, verse 23 and 24 speaks to that obedience. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. You see, it's about obedience. Remaining connected to the vine is about obedience. Are you obediently following the Lord? Are you partially obedient? Are you totally obedient? I don't know if there is any such thing as partial obedience. My wife and I are blessed with three children. Our youngest, Alex, is 12. And time to time, we're saying, Alex, go clean your room. Well, guess what we have to do with our 12-year-old? We have to go in behind him sometimes and check and see, did he clean his room? Because we can say, Alex, did you clean your room? 
You say, yeah. And then we go look. Well, maybe he partially cleaned it, or maybe he shoved everything in the closet or behind the bathroom door or whatever he did, but is partial obedience obedience? I don't guess it is. We're to be fully obedient, totally sold out for Jesus. When we love him, we'll obey his teaching, is what this passage says. Are you being obedient today? Are you walking closely with the Lord today? Are you as excited today about your relationship with Jesus as you were at your highest point in your Christian walk in faith? If you're not, you need to question some things. You need to, you need to re-do uh, some things. You need to reprioritize your time. I believe that's one of the, what, the biggest ways the enemy will get us disconnected from the vine. He'll try to connect us, make us think we need to be connected to this world of social media and this age of technology and instant information. How often does anyone sit and just think and talk to the Lord without pulling out a phone or a device or looking or being distracted or it buzzes and it rings? Think, i got to drop whatever I'm doing. and I gotta, It almost has priority in our life, right? I'm guessing you guys, probably most of you have one of these with you today. No? Yeah? <laughs> are, you, are you addicted to it? Can you survive without it? I'm going to tell you something that drives me crazy. I'm not, I'm just meddling now. I'm not preaching. <laughs> People on our campus, when they come to visit, you know one of the first things is they ask, what's a Wi-Fi? <laughs> I can't do without that Wi-Fi. That's, I believe that's one of the ways that the enemy is going about keeping us from being connected to the mind. Making us think we're connected to something else. Yeah, we're connected to a bunch of garbage. <laughs> Who cares what somebody has to say on Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat and everything? I'm not even naming it. These guys know about it. I don't even have a clue what it is. Don't let that be a vice in your life. Don't let that keep you from staying connected. This is how we stay connected. His Word, through prayer, through fellowship, through gathering together, forsaking not assembling of ourselves together. When I pastored years ago, I had someone who got upset and left our church. He, was, he had a heavy hand in, in building our new church, did most of the work. He was, he was a great carpenter and a fine Christian man. We got a few years into that new building. We were in a business meeting. You may find yourself one day as a pastor standing up and kind of overseeing, orchestrating a business meeting. Godspeed on that. Pray that that goes well for you. I've been in some good ones. I've been in some bad ones. But one of the bad ones was, some, it wasn't a bad, bad thing, but it you know, led to some people being upset. But somebody in the church said, well, why don't we ever use the front door of the church? We come in this side door and we walk down this hallway through the classroom area in the fellowship hall, and then you step into the front of the church, and it's kind of awkward. You just step, if you're late or anything, you step and everybody's looking at you. And we have this beautiful foyer back here, and it's really technically the front door, and there's no sidewalk around there. And somebody said, why don't we just put a sidewalk in from the parking lot around to the front door? And it made sense to the church, and that's what we did. But that one fella, he got upset. He didn't like it. He stopped coming to church. So I went to see him. I said, hey, you know, we miss you at church. He said, we're having church. He said, Brother Larry, we're having church sitting right here at this kitchen table. And I was a young pastor, but I knew enough to know <laughs> that wasn't accurate. I don't doubt, it was not my place to judge, that they weren't walking with the Lord personally. But they weren't assembling together with the body of believers. You see, part of being connected to the vine is also the fellowship of the believers, the encouragement that you'll draw, the attaboys that you'll need from other like-minded folks who love Jesus and are serving and walking alongside with you. To God sends all kinds of people into your life. Some of them will be a distraction. Some of them will be an encouragement. I don't know about you. I like being around people that are encouraging. Somebody comes to me and starts telling me about all the problems of the world, that, that kind of irritates me. Somebody comes to me and talks positively about the good things and maybe they point out something we can do better but you know what I'm talking about. We need to remain though in his love. The best way, listen, this is what you're called to do in ministry. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. If you do that, you will be successful. You will be effective in ministry. On the way over here today, I sent a text message to a pastor over a little further in eastern Kentucky. Just got to know him in the last few years. Not only has he been a blessing to me personally, but his wife has been a blessing 
to my wife. My wife was telling me about something just the other day about this pastor's wife and just a, a mess, a kind message that she sent to her. We need encouragement. We need to love. When, when we love the Lord and we love others, we will encourage one another. That's remaining in love. If you go on in that passage, verse 9 says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. And here comes that obedience thing again in verse 10. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. It's about obedience. It's about faithfulness. Will you be faithful in your calling? There will be times you will question and doubt your calling. That you'll be in the midst of something, you'll say, Lord, is this right? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? And the enemy will begin to seep in and tell you, you need to quit. <laughs> you, that was, listen, that was an ugly four-letter word in my house growing up, Q-U-I-T, quit. You don't quit. You start a sport, and whatever it is, you finish it. Doesn't matter if you like it or not. Don't quit. Don't bail out. When we're connected to the vine, we will not quit. We will not bell out. We will honor his commands. And then through the midst of it all, we'll have joy. Do you have the joy of the Lord today? Even in the midst of something difficult, you have the joy of the Lord. You see, my happiness can be dictated by my circumstance. My emotions can be dictated by my circumstance. My joy of the Lord should not and cannot. If we stay connected to the Lord, we will have the joy of of the Lord, even in the midst of heartache and heartbreak and struggles and trials and problems, we can have the joy of the Lord and we can continue to love others. What's the best example of loving others? It's found in the last verse that I read, verse 13 of John 15. Greater love hath no man than this, than that he lay down his life for his friends. You might be willing to lay down your own life for your friends, your neighbor whomever it might be? Are you willing to also have a, a part in laying down the lives of others that you love, of your family? Let me tell you what some of our folks on our staff go through in their families. God calls people to our ministry, and it's a calling at OBI. And they come to serve. A lot of times they already have children, and they bring their children with them. A lot of times along the way, while they're serving in their ministry, they have children. And I see it all the time. Sometimes their children begin to struggle with, they may not say it out loud, but what they're going through, what's going through their mind is, God might have called mom and dad to this, <laughs> but I don't know if he called me. Angie and I are blessed with three children I mentioned earlier, and we're raising them on the job at OBI. I'm here to tell you, there are going to be times your family will be in harm's way. There will be times in the ministry that your spouse will be in harm's way, and so will your children. But that does not mean that we're to quit, that we're to give up, that we're to get disgruntled or disheartened. When we remain connected to the vine, we can overcome those things. And we won't begin to question, Lord, is this what you have for me and my family? My mother's a very wise lady. My parents get smarter as I get older. Maybe yours do too. But years ago when the opportunity came for Angie and I to return to, to OBI and to serve in the role as president of the school, I was, I was struggling with it. I was wrestling with it, and I was seeking the Lord. I love Onita, but I didn't know, Lord, is this, is this the right thing? We were, listen, we were in southwest Florida. It's pretty nice. <laughs> kind of liked it down there, especially this time of year. But without me even saying it, my mother could see that I was struggling with the idea of returning to eastern Kentucky and bringing my children back to eastern Kentucky and raising my family in Oneida, Kentucky, in Clay County, Kentucky. And so my mother said to me, she said, Son, the very best place for your children is wherever the center of God's will is for you. It's the best place for your loved ones is wherever God's will is for you. Will you remain faithful, obedient? Will you remain in his love so that you can lay down your life? That's literally what happens on the campus of Oneida Baptist Institute every day. People are laying down their lives for young people that God has sent us from all around the world. You are going to encounter people in your ministry, from both locally, sometimes maybe even across the world. Will you sacrifice for them? Will you lay down your life for them? That's what God calls us to do. 
in ministry. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these moments in your word. Thank you for the truth of it. Father, I just pray that um, the word will not return into you void. I pray, Father, as folks leave here, they'll be drawn closer to you. They'll be inspired, uh, Father, to be faithful in all things and to be obedient and remain uh, connected to you and your love. Father, help us to love you the way you love us. Help us to love others the way that you love them. 